Hello, everybody. Uh, good to see you. Let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, wonderful and holy God, that you have not left us alone but that you have blessed us with people, with leaders to whom you have given a special share of your son's spirit to teach, to proclaim the good news about your son Jesus, but most especially to teach the truth um, through your grace about who your son Jesus was and, and what he intended for his community that we call the church. So I thank you for that, Lord, and I ask your blessing upon all of those um, in your church who proclaim the good news, especially in the first place, the Bishop of Rome, Francis, um, for, for, my, for all the patriarchs of the church, um, but especially my patriarchs, Sviatoslav of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, um, for all of the bishops all of those who are overseers in your church, O oh God, um, Bishop uh, Joseph Myers, or I'm sorry, John Myers of Newark, Bishop Joseph Bamber of Scranton, uh, for Metropolitan Archbishop uh, Stefan of Philadelphia, especially, and for all the men um, who serve in this capacity in your church. Please, O oh God, give us holy, holy and good uh, leaders, bishops in your church, who may have as their first desire in their heart um, to love you and to do your will. And I pray this through your Son, uh, the only and chief shepherd, our Lord God and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Let's get back to work. Um, I believe we ended on magisterium all the way at the end here. Whoops. I was on this. Okay. And I'm done with that. So I'm moving on to this. And I'll be on this slide for the the rest of the talk, okay? Um, I'll show you some other stuff, but I'll, I'll remain here um, on this last slide, uh, and I'll talk about this. Okay, we're still talking about magisterium, teaching authority, and hopefully you have read or looked at the sections in the Catechism of the Catholic Church um, in, uh, well, I didn't realize, I'm looking at our schedule here, I didn't realize I was that behind, but I am. Oh, well, but anyways, hopefully I can catch up. Um, you've read these sections in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, so I won't be telling you anything new, um, but if you haven't, uh, you might want to take a look at them, because I'll be addressing them, as you can see from this PowerPoint. Okay? But, before we do that, I taught, mentioned, I talked to you in the last lecture about the fact that Jesus shares his own authority and his own his own power with his apostles. Okay, remember, I'll keep coming back to this. Okay, I'll keep mentioning this. It's all about Jesus. Okay, it's all about Jesus. It's all about what he said, what he did, what he intended. Okay. The, these things that come about, these institutions, we might look at the institutional church and we see a lot of buildings and we see outfits and clothing and people and names and, and all of that, okay? Certainly that's all part of it because we're not spirits. I mean, we live in bodies and, you know, we're, we're fleshly beings and um, we, we are symbolic beings, we do things, we build things, we create things, okay? Uh, so you see the institutional church, okay? 
But even if you didn't have those things, the magisterium is still based on Jesus. Okay? It's not about a bunch of men getting together and saying, as some people might think, gee, you know, okay, well, what are we going to do? Jesus is gone, so let's create this community and, you know, and uh, we'll call it a church and we'll just kind of continue what Jesus is doing. I mean, sociologists might say that that's what happened, or anthropologists, okay? But the belief, or at least the testimony of the New Testament, of the Christian scriptures, uh, is that, and, uh, and of history, is that Jesus established some sort of community around him which continued, okay? And Jesus gave his authority to that community, all right? At least this community claims this. Now we have to see if that claim is true. Is it grounded in, for example, scripture? I mean, if it contradicts, if the, the evidence, the data, the claim contradicts, for example, the foundational documents of Christianity, well, then we've got a problem. But I think, as you'll see, they don't. It's all consistent, pretty much. Okay? Let's look at... Um, I think I had this on a previous slide, actually. Mr. Dunn, you lied to us. You are not a good magisterial authority. <laughs> you said we were only going to stay on this this uh, slide. Whoops, my backspace isn't working for some reason. Huh. That's weird. I mean, if you hit backspace, it should go back, shouldn't it? Hmm. Oh, well. I thought I did. I thought I had it. I know I've seen, I know I saw it, but regardless, pretty sure I had seen this uh, from Matthew, um, the Gospel of Matthew, but uh, I guess I didn't have it here. Let me just take a peek. Oh, I got it. It's uh, Matthew chapter 10, chapter 10, verses 5 to 15. Okay, to just give you an example of what I'm claiming. And we go to our Bible. That's not the Bible. This is the Bible on the website of the uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops. Mm, see the calendar here for November. The red indicates that uh, we have some martyrs coming up. They shed their blood for Christ. Notice the white are just other saints, other holy people. Remember, tradition, people, tradition. Customs. These are customs. The colors are customs. And the rest of the days, the priest is wearing green. Um, or is he? Let's just change the calendar. No, nope. yeah, because then it changes to purple for Advent. Hmm. Yeah. Just custom, just r customs, habits, remember? Not to be confused with sacred tradition. So let's go all the way down here to Matthew, the New Testament, chapter 10. What did I say? Verses 5 to 14, 15? There we are. There we go. Okay. The commissioning of the Twelve. Well, first, before that, look above, and you'll find um, the names of the Twelve Apostles. Okay, Matthew gives us the name names of the Twelve who were chosen especially by Jesus. So actually, I should begin with verse 1. Okay, to show that Jesus gives his own authority. Okay, mission of the twelve. Then Jesus summoned his twelve followers. That's interesting because it makes it sound like these were the only followers, but we know he had more. But it's interesting how, for in Matthew's mind, they're it. Okay, it's just them, the twelve apostles, the twelve disciples, and gave them authority. There you go. End of story. <laughs> but I'll continue. Jesus gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure every disease and illness. Okay, so we have two things that Jesus gave them the power to do. They, he gave them his power of casting out demons, exorcism, in case you don't know how to spell that word, exorcism, okay, which is casting out of an evil spirit, an unclean spirit, and to heal, to cure diseases and illnesses. So, in in uh, and you should know this. So in Matthew, Matthew 
chapter 10, verse 1. 10, verse 1. Jesus gives his authority to the apostles. What authority? Actually, I might do a tab here. First, exorcism. Cast out demons. Whoops. And then two, to heal. These are things that Jesus himself was doing. These are things that Jesus was doing. So he's giving them the authority, the same authority that he had over evil spirits and over illness. I don't know if I'll make this bigger. I'm going to make that Ariel Black and make it bigger. 48? Nah, do that. Interesting, because... Why is this interesting? Because Jesus is giving the twelve apostles not just a spiritual authority. Exorcism is spiritual, my friends. He gives them power over unclean spirits to cast them out. Power and authority over unclean spirits. So he gives them a spiritual authority, but he also gives them physical authority. They have the power to heal physical conditions, illnesses. So they have the power. Both of these things are not part of God's plan. Both of these things are not good things. God doesn't will disease. God doesn't will people to be taken over by unclean spirits, and God doesn't will that there should be unclean spirits. Okay, These, So it's kind of like Jesus is cleaning house. He's like correcting things. And he makes the, the twelve his associates in doing this. He gives them the power to cast out demons and to heal sicknesses. This is not me saying this. This is the Bible saying this. And then Matthew gives us the names of the twelve apostles. And here are their names. We don't need to be concerned about that. I want to skip down to verse 5. Because then what does Jesus do with these twelve? He sends out these twelve after instructing them in this way. Do not go into pagan territory or enter a Samaritan town. Go, rather, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, so his first instruction is, your primary duty is to preach, uh, or to, to do these things, to cast out demons and to heal illnesses amongst Jews first. Okay, so don't go into non-Jewish territories, pagans and Samaritans. Samaritans were related to the Jewish people, but they were not considered Jewish. They were considered outside of the Jews. At one time, they had been part of the people of Israel, the house of Israel, but not anymore. Um, and so Jesus says, don't go to them first. Right? Jesus does have interaction with non-Jews in his ministry. Jesus does interact with non-Jews. He even performs healings for them and miracles. But that's not the purpose right now. Okay, The primary purpose, he is, remember, the Messiah of the Jews, the Christ of the Jews, not the Christ of the pagans or the Christ of the Samaritans. Okay, The Messiah of the Samaritans. The Samaritans weren't expecting a Messiah anyways, um, nor were the pagans. Uh, he is the Messiah of the, the house of Israel. So that's their first priority or the first priority, well, that's an oxymoron. Um, that's their, their primary mission to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Let's take care of things there first, and then we can take care of the other stuff, okay? So, um, something else I wanted to say about that. I thought there was. Oh, I wanted to say, Samaritans still exist. This, they're a very small community, but if you go over to the, the country of Israel, um, there are, you will find Samaritans. They still exist to this day. Um, they're still not considered Jews, but um, they it's interesting. They share a lot of Jewish beliefs, but that's a whole other thing, and I'm not going to go into it. It'll be too, too long. As you go, 
Jesus says, make, this is verse 7, make this proclamation, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The, the rule of heaven, this word kingdom, this is a customary, traditional, <laughs> a customary translation, okay, of this Greek word basileia, basileia, Greek, basileia, okay, which is Greek for rule, reign, um, also kingdom, could be kingdom, yes, yes, um, what other things can we throw in there, um, governance, these are all ways of translating this word basileia from, from Greek, okay, notice, 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 people, that it looks similar to another word we've encountered, Alex, what is Basilica? Yay! You just won Jeopardy! <laughs> okay, Basilica, yes. You know, the, it, it is from, you know, this Latin word, Basilica is related to the Greek word basileia. Okay? Basilica. Remember I told you St. Peter's Basilica. A basilica is just a major church. Okay? It has importance, meaning. It's meaningful um, for some reason. It just has importance to the, chur to the, to the church at large. Um, so it's, it's, it's a church, but it's called a basilica church. Okay? Um, and you can see that comes from this Greek word basileia, rule, governance, kingdom, okay, this, this, uh, you know, all of, all of these terms have the sense of being raised up or powerful, okay, so it's a powerful church. St. Peter's Basilica is a powerful church because the Pope uses it so often, it's part of the uh, Diocese of Rome, okay, um, then you have, um, in Newark, New Jersey, from my neck of the woods, the state of New Jersey, we have Sacred Heart Cathedral in Newark, which is also a basilica. I think it's a minor basilica, though. But anyways, um, because it's it's a large church, it's it's uh, in uh, Newark is one of, is the oldest. I think I think it's the oldest diocese in New Jersey, um, et cetera and so forth. So um, it was it was made a basilica, but I think a minor one, not a major basilica. But anyways, so this Greek word basileia, so Jesus is saying that God's governance, the governance of heaven, the rule of God, is here. And then he tells them what to do. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, drive out demons. Now, let's think of those things. Let's think of those things, because that's interesting. Cure the sick. Cleansing lepers. Okay. You know, that ties in with healing illnesses, curing diseases. Drive out demons. Okay, that ties in with exorcism and casting out unclean spirits. But where does this come in? Raise the dead. Hmm. Is death an illness? A sickness? I don't think it's an unclean spirit, a demon, but, you know, interesting. But what's even more interesting, what's even more interesting is that we have another, another um, power that Jesus has given. It's a spiritual power. It's a spiritual power. Well, actually, it's both, if you think about it. It's both, if you think about it. It's both spiritual and physical. The apostles spiritual and a physical power the apostles have the power to raise the dead
think about that. Jesus has given these 12 men power and authority over life and death. They now have the power to take people who have died and bring them back to life, to give them life again. Okay? Interesting. Interesting. Because I thought that's only a power that God had. That God had. And it was one of those things, Jesus, the fact that Jesus raised the dead was something that troubled people, um, the religious leaders, because only God had control over life and death. No human being did. And yet here was this human being, Jesus, raising dead people. But Jesus is not selfish. You have to understand something about God. Uh, and this might kind of sound childish or silly, but God is a sharer. God shares. And you don't have to ask him to share. He does it willingly. G Jesus, the Son of God, is giving his authority over sickness, over demons, and yes, even over death itself, life, to these twelve men. Men. That's some powerful stuff, people. He's also, notice in verse 7, giving them the power of proclamation, which I think I would put under spiritual authority as well. Uh, I'll put a question mark, because I'm not totally sure in my own mind whether I'd say that's totally spiritual if there or there might be physical characteristics, but the power to proclaim the rule, the kingdom of God. Actually, let me make that more general. The, pow the power to proclaim Jesus' own message. Okay, this is where we're getting to magisterium, folks. This is where we're getting to magisterium. Where is this, Mr. Dunn? Verse 7. Verse 7. Okay? As you go, I, Jesus, tell you, the twelve apostles, to proclaim this. The rule of heaven is at hand. It's near. It's right here, right now. It has come. Technically, in English, you should say, it is come. It is come. You use the verb to be with come. A remnant of our Germanic roots, the Germanic roots of our language. Okay? So, this is the message of Jesus. If you read the Gospel of Mark, what is like the first thing that Jesus does? What's the first thing he says? I'll read it to you. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Put down my Bible for a moment. I'm typing with one hand right now. <laughs> Um, make it larger. Mark chapter 1, verse 14, verses 14 and 15. Jesus came to Galilee, which is in northern Israel, proclaiming the gospel of God. Jesus came proclaiming the good news of God. And this is what he said. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Okay. So if I were to translate or retranslate these words for you so that you can understand better, um, this is the time where everything that was predicted is coming to pass. 
the rule of God, his government, his rulership is right now in front of you. Change your hearts and believe in the good news. Okay? That's the, those are the first words of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. The first words of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. Okay, the first thing that Jesus says in the first Gospel is the proclamation of the rule of God. The rule, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And this message, everything he does, everything, um, everything Jesus does and says is oriented back to, towards this message of God's control, his rule of everything and placing yourself under God's rulership. And now Jesus is giving this message to the, to the apostles. He's allowing them to kind of take over his message. See, he's, Jesus isn't greedy. Jesus is not an egotist. God is not an egotist. God is perfectly comfortable with who he is and what he is. Okay? God is not um, some, you know, maniacal narcissist who it's all about me. You know, only I can do these things. Only I can raise the dead. Only I can cure the sick. Only I can preach the kingdom of God. No. God is generous. God wants us involved in what he's doing. We, he loves us. He wants us involved in what he's doing. So Jesus gives his message to the twelve. So we not only have Jesus giving power and authority to the twelve to do things, but one of those things that I want to emphasize is that he gives them the power and authority to proclaim and interpret the kingdom of God for their listeners. Okay? Okay, Jesus then gives a bunch of other kind of, uh, so, you know, um, sundry instructions about, you know, don't charge people um, for what you're preaching, don't take money with you, um, don't take other clothing, etc. and so forth, okay? When you enter a house, let your peace be upon it, wish it peace, and if the house is worthy, your peace will remain. Chapter, or verse 14, Whoever will not receive you or listen to your words, go outside that house or town and shake the dust from your feet. Amen, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Wow. <laughs> That's some nasty stuff. <laughs> you know, we like to think of Jesus as the peace and love kind of guy, but this is some na this is some heavy stuff, people. This is some heavy stuff. Because I think everyone kind of knows about Sodom and Gomorrah even if you don't know the story, but Sodom and Gomorrah were these towns that God destroyed with fire from from the sky, okay? Um, I'm not going to get into the whole story of why that happened, but Sodom and Gomorrah, if you did not know, look in the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, and uh, you will fi find the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? And uh, basically the story is that they were destroyed... Whoops, what am I doing here? The story is that they were destroyed by God because they were such evil cities and God had had enough. So he destroyed them. Wiped them off the face of the earth. Think about that and then reread what Jesus says here. Whoever won't receive his apostles or listen to what they say, those who reject, reject the disciples, the followers of Jesus who have his power and authority, Jesus says that it will be more tolerable, it will be better 
for Sodom and Gomorrah on the last day, the day of judgment, than for those who have rejected his followers and their teaching. Wow. <laughs> that sounds like a condemnation to hell to me. <laughs> you know, that's, that's some heavy stuff. You know, Jesus is bringing the big time hammer here. I mean, Jesus is going old school. You know, he's not mincing any words. He's not being nice, nice. He's saying, you're there bringing them the message and they still reject it? You know, shake the dust from your feet against them. Because, and when you do that, on the day of judgment, Sodom, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah will fare better before God than these people will. They'll receive a heavier punishment than the evil people of Sodom and Gomorrah, who were so evil that God wiped their towns off the face of the earth. Now, God is a God of mercy, yes, okay? And people may have rejected the words of the apostles for a lot of reasons. I wasn't there. I don't know. Okay? Um, could this be hyperbole? Could Jesus be saying something extreme to show the seriousness? Could be. Or he could mean exactly what he says he means. You know, when you have the truth put in your face, and you still are like, no, nope, not going to follow it even though you know it's the truth, then how can you avoid judgment? I don't know. I'll just leave that out there. Okay? Alrighty then. So, we have this from Jesus, from the scripture. So, I know that people kind of get uncomfortable <coughs> with authority in the church. And, uh, you know, especially, I, I've, I've had many friends who were Protestant, um, mainly Presbyterian. I don't know why I keep bumping into Presbyterians throughout my life, but I do. Um, but, you know, I've known Lutherans and Baptists, and, and they don't really have an authority structure. I mean, they do, but it's kind of like, you know, just to kind of keep things going, you know, to pay the rent on the building or to, you know, fix the leaky pipes, you know. It's like if some pro Baptist churches, you know, you have your worship service on Sunday and then you have a business meeting, <laughs> you know, to, right after to talk about, well, what's going on, you know, how's the uh, church picnic coming, you know, do, do we have enough food, and, you know, to take over. The, so there is like an authority. There might be a manager. And, of course, there's the pastor. But pastors are kind of like there to preach you know, preach the gospel, um, lead the worship services. Um, it's not so much that you have a bishop who's a teacher and like a father figure. In fact, some denominations completely eschew that kind of form. Eschew. Interesting English word. You know, means they, they uh, avoid, avoid, try to get away from even that kind of form. And so you have, you know, Protestant churches, like you might be driving along and you see a church, little church, and the sign outside says, you know, Word of God Baptist Free Church. It's a free church. You know, or non-denominational, or independent, or something like that, which means that they're basically going it alone. You know, they they don't have, they're they're not only do they not have bishops, priests, and deacons telling them what to do, they don't have like a national structure also telling them what to do. They're on their own. You know, they're a free church, stuff like that. Okay, um, I I. I'm not one of those. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm not a member of a free church or an independent church. Okay? I'm a member of a church that is very interconnected. Look at this. I mean, you've got people of African ancestry, of Middle Eastern ancestry, um, Argentine, Italian ancestry, Myers, I, I think might be Irish, but I'm not sure. I think, well, this guy, I forget. Um, Ukrainian, Slav, um, Indian, 
okay, from India. So we have Asian ancestry, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, Asian from Vietnam, um, Southeast Asian. And many, many, many more, okay? We, the Catholic Church is like the, the, the Church of Jesus. It's all interconnected. All the apostles, even though they were sent out by Jesus two by two, they were still out there supposed to be preaching the same message and doing the same thing as Jesus. They weren't off on their own in some free church, okay? Some independent denomination, okay? Um, you know, Jesus gives the apostles some pretty, um, pretty strong authority and some pretty, um, I mean, the word I'm looking for here is for, for here is palpable, but I want to find another word. Let me go to my thesaurus. Let's see if they've got this palpable. Um, solid, concrete. That's what I'm looking for. Tangible, solid, concrete. Jesus gives the apostles concrete authority. I mean, it's not just some kind of, you know, pie in the sky, airy fairy, you know, kind of fairy dust type, you know, oh yeah, you know, just talk about peace and love and be nice to people. He no, he gives some very concrete specific powers to the twelve. Cast out evil spirits, heal sicknesses, raise the dead, preach a certain message. The rule of God is here. And, by inference, they would have to interpret that message for their listeners. I doubt they were just going around saying all the time, the kingdom of heaven is here. Yeah, but what does that mean? It means the kingdom of heaven is here. Okay, you know, Simon the Zealot, but what does it mean? The kingdom of heaven is here. Okay, Jude, we get this. <laughs> but what do you mean? You know, I'm, I'm assuming they interpreted. Okay, so... Here we, you know, here we go. Here we go. We have, right from the lips of Jesus himself, from his own actions, um, a clear example of Jesus giving a share of his own authority as Messiah and Son of God, his mission from his Father to his own followers, specifically the Twelve Apostles. Okay? They were to do what Jesus was doing and to preach what Jesus was preaching. Not their own stuff, not their own little ideas, own opinions, but what Jesus was doing. It all comes back to Jesus. Remember that. I thought there was something else I wanted to say, but I can't remember. Okay. Da, da, dee, dee. So this was while Jesus was present. Okay, Jesus was there on earth with his followers. But even more so after he was gone. Okay? Even more so after he was gone, um, the, the, the apostles became, their role in his community became even more important because he wasn't there anymore. Jesus wasn't there anymore to say, okay, this is what I said, and, more importantly, this is what I meant. He wasn't there to do that anymore. At least not physically. I mean, of course Jesus is there, you know, even after he ascends to glory. Um, but, you know, we have to... Uh, the point I want to make is that the message of Jesus and about Jesus... Because we can use that possessive in, in two different ways. Okay, the message, Jesus' message, the message of Jesus. Jesus is in the possessive case. Jesus' message, Jesus' apostrophe message, his message. It can, be, it can be used in two different ways. His message, what he actually proclaimed, but it can also be the message about him. The message of Jesus, meaning about Jesus. So both of these the message that Jesus proclaimed as well as the message that was proclaimed about Jesus whether it was spoken by word of mouth I know that's oxymoronic again I guess I'm in that kind of fashion today um, kind of saying the same thing by two different words 
um, whether it was spoken by mouth or whether it eventually got written down. Doesn't matter. This message does not exist and did not exist in a vacuum. Okay, sometimes I think people can treat the Bible, especially the Bible, as if it exists in a vacuum. But the Bible is part of Christian history. It was written by actual people who existed within their Christian history, wherever, whenever they were, wherever they were. Okay? God was not sitting at a table writing the letter to the Thessalonians. Jesus was not sitting down at a table writing the Gospel of Mark. Especially since they didn't do that back then. <laughs> you know, you didn't sit at tables and write like that. That wasn't common. I'm not saying people never did it, but it wasn't a common practice. Usually we're squatting down or sitting down on the ground with a scroll and stuff like that. But, uh, but you get my point, okay? Other people later wrote down their own memories about him, their own preaching about him, or what they had heard about him and had been passed on authoritatively, magisterially, through Jesus' community called the Church. Authoritatively equals magisterially. The Twelve Apostles in particular, and I say in particular because only they were, given, were chosen for this, were given a role and an authority within Christ's community to carry his gospel to the world. So, am I saying, and does the church say, that Christians, all Christians, should not proclaim the good news about Jesus to the world? No. No! No! Oh! Oh! <laughs> no! All Christians, by our baptism, we are all called to live like Jesus, to talk about Jesus, to proclaim him to others in the way that we can, in the way that we can. You don't have to be a theologian to talk about Jesus. You don't have to be a biblical expert to talk about Jesus. You don't have to be a priest to talk about Jesus. Okay? Do you have to talk about Jesus all the time? Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. You know, it's not like you know, you know. It's like uh, you know. I, I understand. You know, no. But but Jesus should be your passion, should be the Lord of your life, the Lord of your wallet, the Lord of 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 your sex life, um, the Lord of your family, the Lord of your um, uh, of what you're reading every day, the Lord of how you drive, the Lord of how you go to school, the Lord of how you work, everything. He should be Lord of everything. Nothing should be kept from him. And certainly you can talk about him. Um, and it's especially important that if you're going to talk about Jesus, that you're living like Jesus and loving like Jesus and showing mercy like Jesus. Okay, because you might talk about Jesus to somebody and uh, you might be saying things that are true absolutely true, but your life is so messed up that a person looks at your life and says, yeah, well, Jesus hasn't helped you that much. Or says, you know, well, you're just a hypocrite. You know, you say, you know, this is Jesus and this is what Jesus is about and I see how you treat people and you treat people like dirt. Okay? So just be aware of that. End of sermon. So the apostles were given a special authority amongst all of Jesus' followers. See, remember Matthew chapter 10. Jesus did not give his authority to all of his followers. He chose the twelve whom he wanted. Matthew is very clear about that. Jesus chose 
the 12 followers whom he wanted. Matthew even gives us their names. And it is to them, not to everybody, but to them that he gives these special powers, these specific powers. So, to recap, no, Mr. Dunn is not saying that you should not proclaim the good news about Jesus Christ and his church. We are all called to do that. In whatever way that we live, I do this as a, as a teacher. You may do it as a baseball player. You may do it as a housewife or a house husband. Who knows? You may do it as a businessman or businesswoman. You may do it as a military person. But whatever you're doing, yes, we should all be proclaiming the good news about Jesus, that he has risen from the dead and saved us from our sins. Um, but, but out of the followers of Christ, some have been specifically chosen to have this authority and power that Jesus gave to the apostles to continue it in his community. Okay? So this is teaching authority. The, uh, this is where the bishops come in. These men we call bishops. Bishops. Okay, and I think I want to look here at the catechism. I want to look, I think it's 77 and 78. Uh, this is an excellent website which has the catechism. Here we go. Apostolic tradition. Uh... Actually, maybe no, I don't want to go to 77, 78. Um, but I want to go to the 8. Uh, well, maybe, maybe I do, but I'm not. I'm in the right... I'm in the ballpark, Mr. Sroka. But uh, that's not what I want. I think I want further down here. 85, there it is. Let me make it bigger so it's easier to read. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 85. The task of giving an authentic, a true, a proper interpretation of God's Word, whether in Scripture or tradition, whether in its written form, sacred Scripture, or in the form of tradition, sacred tradition, this task has been given and trusted to the living teaching office of the church alone. Now, how can the church say that? Doesn't that sound domineering? Doesn't that sound like control? You know, a top-down structure? Yeah! <laughs> of course, you know. But, but they've got a very solid biblical basis for it. They've got a very solid basis from the example of Jesus. Jesus was top-down. Jesus was the top. And then he chose 12 guys beneath him to share in his task of interpreting and preaching God's word, his father's word, his message. Okay? Jesus didn't give it to everybody. He gave it specifically to 12. It was limited to them. The authority of the magisterium is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Okay? And we see here our reference number 47. Let's go take go down and take a look at what that is. Oh, okay, it's quoting from the Second Vatican Council. Um, you might not know what this is um, because it's abbreviated, but this is a document from the Second Vatican Council, um, number 10. All right. Don't worry about it. Okay. So they're quoting from that document, from uh, a universal council of the church. So it has, you know, mucho authority for the, for the church. Okay, then they give a little interpretation. What does this mean? It means that the task, the work of interpreting, has been entrusted to the bishops in communion with the main bishop, the Bishop of Rome. Okay, so as I showed you on my picture, okay, why did I do it that way with the Bishop of Rome in the center? even though these are all bishops, they're all equal, they're all bishops, including him, but the Bishop of Rome has been given a special um, service, a special grace, okay, of unity amongst the bishops. Okay, that's a whole other issue that I'm not going to get into right now, um, but it, al it also goes back to the apostles 
and which of the apostles Jesus chose to be the leader or the first amongst the apostles. But that's a whole other thing. But anyways, just all you should know really is that all the bishops, the overseers in the church, the bishops have been given this task because the bishops are believed to be it's just another name okay for for the apostles in a way that you have the 12 apostles whoops apostles and the 12 apostles they're men you know they die they die off i mean they're men they're human beings and if the if it's all of, if it were all about the 12 apostles then once the last apostle died off we're screwed <laughs> we were screwed a long time ago then you know saint john the apostle is the last one believed to have died that's just an historical tradition custom legend we don't know actually who was the last but you know everyone kind of knew that saint john the apostle was the last to die okay i'll take that as historically true I have no reason to doubt it, but I can't prove it to you. But, you know, when John the Apostle died and there were no apostles left, you know, we're up, uh, you know, uh, we're up, uh, you know, the proverbial creek without a paddle. Because who's left? Unless they passed on their authority. Unless, as the apostles were going on, preaching the message, doing their thing, okay, just as Jesus had chosen them, they chose other men and passed on their authority to them. To, co to do what? To do exactly the same thing. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Preach the kingdom of heaven. These men we call bishops. And believe that's what bishops are supposed to do. First of all, proclaim the good news about Jesus Christ. Secondly, to do all the other things that Jesus said. Cast out demons. Bishop has the power of exorcism. In fact, technically, technically, in the ritual of exorcism, which, yes, the Catholic Church still does, we still have exorcisms, the, the, the devil is alive and well in the world and possesses people. Not, not, he doesn't can't force himself upon anybody. The devil cannot force himself upon you. Uh, you know, forget what Hollywood says. All right, Hollywood is Hollywood. Hollywood makes horror movies. Okay, um, the devil is a creature just like you are, just like I am. No better, no worse. Okay, he's just a different kind of creature. So he has powers to a degree that we don't have. But we also have powers that the devil doesn't have. You know, for example, don't you think the devil might not, you know, would 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 not mind the opportunity to go to confession and have his 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 sin forgiven, and be completely fresh and clean in the eyes of God, so he could go back, so he could go to heaven. But he can't, because angels don't have the power to to change their choices. They have the freedom to choose, but once they make a choice, just the way their nature is, they can't go back on it. Whereas w with humans, you know, you can change your change your pants five times a day if you want to. You know, <laughs> you know say, or you can change your religion. You know, now I believe in Jesus. Now I don't. I'm a Buddhist. Well, no, I don't like the Buddha anymore. I think I'll believe in Muhammad. Well, Muhammad, yeah, I don't know. I'll follow. I'll follow. Uh, you know, Guru Rajneesh or somebody. <laughs> you know, we can do these things. Angels can't. So we have powers and abilities that the angels don't have. But they also have powers that are superior to ours, like knowledge and stuff like that. So the devil is a creature. He's not God or like second to God. Not at all. Second to nobody is the devil. And that's what kills him. That's why he's the devil. You know? Um, perhaps. There are stories about it. By the, how the devil became the devil. Um, but Christ, Jesus, as God's son, has power over the devil. Uh, so do Christians, so does the church. Uh, so, of course, we do, you know, if a person, and a person, a person 
The devil can only enter in if a person gives him permission. You have to give evil permission to enter into your life. And demonic possession, diabolical possession, is only when a person has given his life or her life so much that the, that the demon, the evil spirit, takes control. Okay, that's the thing. All these Satanists who say, you know, I'd rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. Oh, really? Well, I'd like to take them to a real possessed person and show them what reigning in hell looks like because the devil is about control, power, and he does not share power. Jesus does. God does. Devil do not. He wants all the power. He's not giving power away to anybody. So that's where the church has to enter in and to kind of take back from from the devil. Uh, excuse me, I'm just stretching. Uh, take back from the evil one what is properly God's. God's property, not the devil's. And saving people from his power when they've kind of gone too deep. They've given too much permission. They've signed away their life to the evil one. So, but in the ritual for exorcism, getting back to what I, my original point, um, the ritual for exorcism which the church has, technically, technically, it is a bishop who's supposed to perform it. Now, bishops customarily delegate that authority to a priest, which is fine, um, but technically, technically, a bishop is, is supposed to be the one who's performing the exorcism. And certainly, you cannot do an exorcism without the permission of the bishop of the diocese. You need the bishop's approval, because he is the high priest. He is the one who is the successor to the apostles. Okay, The power that Jesus gave to the apostles has been given to him. Okay. This teaching authority, magisterium, is not superior to the word of God, but is its servant. That's a very important statement. The teaching authority of the church is not above God's word. It serves it. And here's where we get to rather hard sayings of the church. You know, there might be Catholics who have same-sex feelings and may even really truly be in love with a person of the same sex and want to show that love sexually um, as well as spiritually living with the person, but not, not just living with the person, but also expressing that love um, through the sexual, what, well, what we call it sex, but it's not really sex, but anyways, um, at least not heterosexual sex, okay, but expressing that love. And the church says no. The, the action, you know, oral sex or anal sex are contrary to the will of God, and hence they are sinful actions. Um, and the desire, the sexual attraction for someone of the same sex is disordered. It is not the way God wanted things to be. Okay? This is just an example. This is just an example. There may be people out there and there may be people listening to this who are like, I wish it were another way. Why can't it be another way? Why can't love just be love? You know, why does it have... I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Okay? Um... You know, I, c I can see, and I'm not saying I disagree with the church. I don't. I accept the teachings of the church on the matter. Um, but if you're asking, you know, if you want sympathy, I can sympathize in the sense that, you know, I understand how someone might want it to, to have been a different way, or if God could have done it another way. Okay? And you would want the church to teach that. Or you might say, you know, well, you know, the Bible or whatever is an old document. It comes from a long time ago, a different culture, and the church needs to recognize that and move on. 
and kind of bring the Bible with it. I'm not saying reject the Bible, but bring the Bible along with it into modernity, okay? And, uh, you know, not necessarily change the teaching, recognize that that teaching was there about homosexuality amongst men and women, but say, you know what, we're in a different cultural context and things have changed and we recognize, do recognize that love is love. And just like, you know, we don't uh, own slaves anymore or we don't uh, kill adulterers, we, we, don't, we recognize that, you know, people can show their love in other ways than just heterosexual sex. Okay, I understand that. You know, I understand that argument. Um, I'm not going to teach it to you. I'm not going to say I agree with it because I don't. Because it's not, I don't believe it's the teaching of the church. But these are things that people might argue and might think. Why? You know, why can't the church just teach this? Just teach it. Forget about what the Bible says. Well, this is the problem for you. You have to explain... Um, well, this is the problem, because the moment that the Church does that, she is no longer the servant of God's revelation. She is now the superior and the controller of God's revelation. She now decides what is the right teaching and what isn't the right teaching what should be and what should not be. Who Jesus was, what he was, and what he was not. And you say, well, that, so what? You know? Well, so what? <laughs> that changes everything. You know? That places us in control, not God. You know? Re God reveals himself. God is not bound to reveal himself to anyone. Okay? He reveals himself out of love. Okay? Um, and when he, in God, it's God's revelation. God gets to say what it means and what he wants. Not the church's, not the church. And I'm talking now about homosexuality, but we could, I could also talk about women priests. I could also talk about people who um, get married in the church validly. They have valid marriages in the church. They get divorced. Late, they get legally divorced later, and then they remarry without the without the permission of the church. Okay, technically they're still married to the first person. So also technically they're living in a state of adultery with the next person. Okay, um, and also technically, because they are in a state of serious sin, i.e. adultery, they should not be receiving the body and blood of Christ. These are all things. Things that people might wish were changed. Developed. Okay? Um, development. Doctrinal development, we call it. But they can't be. Not really, because the church is not the controller in this relationship. God is. And so, the next sentence. The church teaches only what has been handed on to her. At God's command, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, the church, the magisterium, listens devotedly to God's word, Okay, with passion, you know, passion to be passionate, devoted. She guards it with dedication. She guards it to protect God's revelation. And she expounds it faithfully. In other words, she teaches it correctly. Okay? And we stop there. The rest of that statement we don't need to worry about. Is this also Dei Verbum 48? This might all be from... Uh, yeah, 48 and then the Gospel of Luke. Okay. So the magisterium is the servant of God's revelation in scripture and tradition. Okay. Now I've mentioned some hot button issues um, like homosexuality, divorce, women priests, um, 
but what about Jesus? I mean, if the church can say, well, you know, um, yeah, I mean, the Bible was in a cult set in a cultural period of time where same-sex feelings were, you know, kind of viewed negatively, and that's just resent that that historical feeling is simply just represented in the Bible. It's not an actual teaching that we have to follow anymore, and we can recognize that love is love, and so we, the church, say that, um, you know, that uh, what we've been saying for all this time uh, um, is wrong, or not wrong, but has developed, and so, you know, um, it's not sinful to have to have sex, uh, you know, anal or oral sex with another person of the same sex, or, you know, to have these feelings. These feelings are perfectly legitimate, um, exactly as God would, would has planned it, you know, by putting love in our hearts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that sounds great, but, you know, the same thing can happen to something that you might care about, that you believe deeply about, like Jesus. You might believe deeply Jesus is God. Well, why can't the church play the same game? You know, Jesus was called God because Paul, the apostle, the rabbi, was simply using language from Greek religion that people would have understood. Uh, he did not necessarily mean that Jesus was actually God. He was just trying to show that Jesus was a powerful man in in God's, you know, that he had God's approval. And he was very close to God so much so that you could call him a son of God. Uh, et cetera, and so forth. But he really was just a guy. He was a man. He really didn't work any miracles. Um, or he didn't really, he wasn't really raised from the dead. He died and was buried. Um, but, you know, God kind of showed his approval by glorifying Jesus, what we call the resurrection. That's just kind of like God's seal of approval, you know. So all the stuff that we've been teaching for the last, you know, few a couple thousand years, you know, we've developed beyond that people, you know, there are churches that have done this. I mean, if you want an example, uh, I think, this is my personal opinion, you don't have to agree with it, but if you want an example of a church, a denomination that is not the servant of the Word of God, but is rather superior to it, and acts like the controller of the Word of God, I'd say go to an Episcopal church. The Episcopalians, they'd love to have you. Mainly because they're dying out. <laughs> You know, their numbers keep getting less and less and less and less. But, you know, go go to the Episcopalian church, you know. Be my guest. Go take a look. Take a look. You know, this is this is all going on, and it's tearing their church apart. It's tearing their church apart. Their denomination apart. Um, because on just about every issue, you can, you can kind of believe what you want to believe and argue what you want to argue, you know. Homosexuality, divorce, was Jesus just a man or was he God? What, you know, what I was just arguing to you. Um, you've had bishops in the Episcopal Church argue this about Jesus. You know, Bishop John Shelby Spong, who was the uh, Bishop of Newark, where I'm from, New Jersey, in New Jersey, I should say. Spong, that's an interesting last name, I don't know where he got it from. Um, that's almost like a name you just you try to make up, you know. <laughs> but anyways, he was John Shelby Spong. He's retired now, you know. But he wrote books in which he talked about what he called atheistic Christianity. You know, kind of believing in the principles of Christianity about love and acceptance, tolerance, mercy, all that stuff, forgiveness. Um, all the principles, you know, help your neighbor, love your enemy, all that good stuff, but without necessarily having to believe that Jesus was divine, was the Son of God, uh, or the Messiah uh, of the Jews, or even, really even having to believe that there's a God at all, but still believing in the principles that Jesus taught. Hence, atheistic Christianity is what he called it. And this guy was a leader in the Episcopal Church. Now, I'm not you know, washing other people's dirty laundry in public. I mean, this is well known. I'm also not criticizing them. If they, if that's what they want to be, fine. That's their decision as a community. But I would say that they're not being the servant of God's revelation. And the church is supposed to be. Where are we here? Ooh, we're at an hour. 
Um, okay, so I'll end this, and then I'll come right back to it in the next session.